Komori Manga Chapter 2 Review, Devil in the Details. I think this is another good chapter, but it has some issues this time around for me. I also saw some of the discourse and thought I would give my own perspective on some of the issues people have with the manga so far. So I'll be injecting some of that in this chapter, including returning to Chapter 1. There will always be heavy spoilers for my reviews of Amori chapters. So to cover the events of this chapter, we first go through the playground segment in Headspace. This is a notable showing of the quicker pace that the manga is going at, as we completely skip the hide-and-seek game that they played in the video game. It is fully omitted, as boss's reason for starting the fight is because of not being invited to the picnic that happens before the playground game, rather than the actual game. It's a shame that, as of now at least, the new readers won't get to meet the other members of the playground. They aren't truly important to the story, but the NPCs add a lot to the flavor of the world. We then go to the scene of everyone heading to Basil's house, with the scenery looking absolutely beautiful. It proceeds like the game, ending with the chilling visuals as usual. I also think this is meant to give us a taste of, of the something that Basil sees, which you can tell better here than in the video game. We then head back into the real world, learning that the headspace segment was shown while Sunny was blacked out during the fight with Aubrey. Sunny going in and out of headspace while in the middle of real life is portraying his dissociation in a different way than the game. This is a substantial change, and I can completely understand people immediately being adverse to that. But like I said in the previous review, I want to continue seeing how this plays out before calling this bad, and I'm still not fundamentally against this being a different experience. I do acknowledge that changes like this are potentially worse for people new to Amori than to returning fans though, so it's not, it's, it could very much be worse for them than it is for people like me who is a bit who is a big fan. But I don't think anything so far has gone as far as to make the manga bad. I've seen people saying that, but personally I think that is a bit of an exaggeration. Once Sunny wakes up, things play out as usual, ending with a scene that I will get to at the end of the review. Now, I'll be getting into some criticisms from me and addressing some from others. Let's not get furious and remember to calm down when engaging in disagreements and making critiques, especially online. Take the time to think things through and read and listen fully when it comes to the manga and to other people's opinions. We all want to enjoy things, but we inevitably see things differently. Don't fall victim to trolls, bait, and people who go to extremes just for interaction clicks, etc. Not making any accusations, but this is a thing in general on the internet and I personally believe there is some of that concerning the Amori manga as well, and the discourse surrounding it. It is not my intention to call anyone dumb, not a real Amori fan, or prove people wrong just for some smug satisfaction. My goal is to give my opinions on subjective stuff and attempt to clarify how I see things that I believe are more objective interpretations. To be clear, I'm not claiming to be an expert at reading manga and deciphering visual details and writing direction and all of that kind of stuff. I can be wrong too. And it is just, this is all my opinion. Most people are not experts, and people will see things differently due to their own opinions and ways of thinking, but there is often objective truth to the way things are told. You absolutely can be seeing things incorrectly. Some of the blame can go to the artist not doing a good job conveying movement and things like that, but sometimes readers are just not following it correctly. However, how confusing something is visually is also up to the eye of the beholder. So the point is saying everyone has their own opinions, but there is some objective fact to how things are done and portrayed. So let's just all keep in mind when we're talking about stuff like this and looking at it, things in a more critical lens. So I'll start by talking about the main fight of this chapter, which will include some criticism about how the fight is presented, then return to the main fight of the previous chapter, and for that one I'm going to go on the defensive for the fight presentation. So I added some drawings on the pages because I'm not an expert at explaining these things and I try my best to do it just in writing and through talking like this. But I think this could be helpful to properly explain how I am seeing things in this fight. Hopefully that will make things easier to understand and comprehend. So starting with the good on the boss fight, because I haven't talked about it yet, I like the fundamentals of how the fight is portrayed. 
So am I the only one who heard the attack sound effects in my head with the with the Mori's attack that he does doing the critical damage sound due to how dramatic his attack looks? And I love that we still see the damage numbers. Even though we're no longer experiencing this as a video game, in Amori's head, in-universe, his fantasy is still gamified. And yeah, I just think that's just super fun, and it's just, it's something that I expected, but I'm glad it came through, because it's, it just, it just made sense to do. So I want to check if the damage numbers we see from everyone in the fight are accurate, and they seem to be, which is awesome. There's some level of damage rolls, so when I recently just quickly got to the boss fight again myself, the numbers weren't exact, but again, there's rolls, like in a lot of video games, so the difference between someone doing 12 damage and 14 damage, that's still very accurate to the game. Boss's design also looks great. He really stands out compared to everyone else, and looks truly like a cartoony enemy. So this is exactly what I wanted to see, about the visual presentation, about stuff concerning Headspace. I think that's great. But now onto the actual fight itself, my criticism about the effects of the attacks on Boss. The bruise left by Kel when he first attacks seems like it switches sides. So yeah, if you, yeah, I'll explain in a second, but this is just my interpretation. I think I'm reading this correctly. I think this is just a genuine mistake, but if you disagree, feel free to explain is first shown on the same side as Basil, but then is on the opposite side. He only hits him once, based on only seeing the one text box before Aubrey hits him on the same side as the first. We do see a bump on Basil's side on the next page, but that was from Hero after the panel, where he has two bumps on the same side when I feel like there should only be one. So yeah, unless I'm confused and misinterpreting things, this is, this is an example of a visual detail being incorrect. Hopefully, this is just a one-off mistake that won't happen again. It's a minor thing, and this is still a very fun, good scene, but the blunder does leave a mark on the record as the first legit mistake that I personally felt. But I know with the past fight, people did also have their own issues, but now it's my turn to defend that. So now onto the fight with Aubrey of Chapter 1, where, in my opinion, from what I see, there is not a mistake in anything here. People are genuinely just incorrect in their interpretation of what happens in the fight. So they have the misconception that Aubrey knocked Basil to the ground by hitting him with the bat. What really happens is Aubrey brings her bat next to Basil's face to intimidate him, then takes that moment of him being off guard to trip him. I'll explain how the scene goes down through my eyes, and again for this one too. I have, I have some arrows and drawings to hopefully aid in the confusion that some people seem to have. So note that she's holding the bat on her right side. She swings the bat to the right, opposite of Basil, and backwards, indicated by the movement lines at the end of the bat going backwards. Then sweeps Basil's legs using her left leg to trip him and send him crashing to the ground. She never hits him with the bat. I feel this was made very clear by her leg being outstretched where Basil's legs were before. If this was not the case, why would she be standing on one leg after swinging a bat that was inches from Basil's face? If she just hit him with a bat, why would the bat be behind her head the moment where Basil goes down? It would be closer to where her leg is. So, things get into criticisms. Yeah, this gets into criticisms that I saw people make towards Aubrey's character. Saying that she's flanderized or exaggerated, whatever, and similar terms in the manga, and I do not believe this is the case at all. In my opinion, she is not being more extreme in her actions than in the game. Aubrey does not bash Basil's head in with a spike bat, as I just said, as I just made clear, and she would never do that. She did not intend to severely hurt Basil in the chapter 1 fight the same way she did not intend to nearly drown him when she pushed him into the lake later in the game. She is a physically aggressive person as we consistently see in Headspace and in the real world, in both the manga and the game. And in the real world, she is severely unwell, acting out due to her life that has only gone worse and worse since Mari's death. In the real world battles, which are intended to be treated as, tr as truly happening, she never hurts anyone to the point of serious damage. And in the real world, she is severely unwell, 
acting out due to her life that has only gone worse and worse since Mari's death. In the real world battles, which are intended to be treated as truly happening, she never hurts anyone to the point of serious damage, nor does anyone else outside of Sunny in the first fight when she when he cuts her with a knife. The point of the first fight immediately ending after Amori uses the knife is because that caused serious damage that would be very severe in a real life setting. Nothing Aubrey does to you in those fights does that. We knew she bullied Basil in the game. We just see it here directly in more detail which makes it feel worse. It makes it seem more extreme because we actually have so much more visual detail of that experience. But it is still stuff that happened in the game. I think her actions in the manga fit her personality in the game and that there really isn't anything inconsistent in my opinion. If you have different interpretations feel free to share as long as everyone's being amicable and you're hopefully backing it up with some actual evidence. But yeah, I think I think Aubrey's character is fine. So, in continuing with Aubrey, one of my compliments to this chapter and how the manga portrays Aubrey's personality goes to the extension of the scene where Aubrey throws out the photo album shown at the end of the chapter. The original scene in the game is very quick and does not denote much emotion to me, at least. I've said that the manga provides more opportunity to portray emotions through faces and body language. Here we are seeing that. It's made very clear that she is not happily that she is not happy pushing everyone away and throwing away the album, but she is controlled by her anger and her regret. You can see her disdain for the state of the album and how it's driven her and her friends apart, her hesitation to throw it away, her anger taking over and making her violently throw it in and her sadness as she closes it and walks away fully aware of what she's doing, how she's just growing that distance that's already been growing. And I love the detail that after looking at the picture, which included Sunny, she holds her hand over the bandage on her arm where Sunny cut her in the first chapter. She also heads to the church where they will find her next. Without the opportunity to explore in the game, I think it makes sense to make everyone's locations more clear. I do think showing a map of the city would help the viewers new to the series. The game didn't either, but the player ends up making a mental map while running around, which obviously people just reading the manga can't do. So this scene in the manga evokes a lot of emotion for Aubrey, which the game lacks in that same moment, and is really this really added a lot to me towards the overall scope of Amori as a story and experience. Aubrey's turmoil may not be presented the exact same way, and it could be argued as worse due to the pacing, but scenes like this to me really work. This is an excellent scene, and it does what only the manga can do. So, and with this scene, we reach the end of the chapter, and is where I will end things off. So I am still very much enjoying the manga, and plan to continue following it, and I plan to continue talking about it. So. Uh, let me know if you think the little drawings I did on the images for the fight is worth doing when I'm getting deeper into visual detail. I can't guarantee that I'll be doing that again, but there's a very good chance that I will. So if you think that works, if you think that helps, please let me know. I'd love to hear that feedback. And just to talk a little bit more about the whole discourse side of things, I'm not a huge fan of internet discourse, and I do not directly participate in it much, but I do try to pay attention to the community and their, their thoughts and feelings when it's a series that I care about more, such as Amori. So I do try to read comments online and stuff a bit, but I do still very much distance myself and keep that pretty limited. A lot of people can be nasty and reading and listening to a lot of that type of discourse really doesn't amount to much. It's really not as beneficial if it's that type of thing where people aren't being substantive, aren't actually backing things up saying, oh, I don't like this character, how this character is portrayed, but they don't say any reason why. They think this particular thing looks bad, but they barely go into detail as to why. So and with that type of thing, that is just not very, it's just not really beneficial to anyone. So that's the type of thing I try to stay away from and where I strive to with my content to be more substantive, to be more positive and not be as aggressively negative as I feel some people can be. So I hope that tone comes through in my writing. I hope that's something, uh, hope that's something appealing. 
that's the type of content that I look for, and I hope that is the type of content other people will enjoy as well. So when it comes to my community, discussion is very much welcome. As long as people, as I said, are being polite, and they're being substantive with their opinions, so everyone can have an informative and a healthy dialogue, I think that is the best state of things. Talking about and criticizing things is totally fine. I don't, I mostly praise things, honestly, with, I just have more fun and have more passion for talking about the things that I enjoy than having more critical things. But obviously, as you can see, I do very much bring up criticisms. It's not that I avoid talking about criticisms. I just, I don't really want to write slam pieces, basically. That's just not fun to me, and I don't think that's all that useful, unless it's some serious, notable topic that I can go into detail on. So, yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this, and if you like that kind of thing, please stick around. And if you continue following the Mori manga, I will, as I said, I will continue following it. And you can check out my blog in the description. Thank you. Yeah, let's, thank you very much. If everyone want, and wants to engage in discourse, please do so, but please remember to get along and be cordial. Thank you very much for listening.